This is Cannon Fodder, episode 42, live from Denmark with my good friend, Mr. Christopher Sandbach. How are you, sir? Yeah, I've never been to Denmark before in my life. I don't know what he's talking about. Yeah. We're, we're, well, we're, 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 we're anywhere but Denmark. Oh, no, we're not in Denmark? All right, fine. We're in, let's see, I guess because we're talking about T.S. Eliot, I guess we're talking about, uh, we're from, we're in America. How about that? Yeah, yeah. I'm glad you didn't say England. This is this is this is an American show, and we claim T. S. Eliot is an American here. Tom Tom Eliot, uh, noted American. He sounds so much more American if you call him Tom, like old Tom Eliot. Yeah, not not like George Eliot, that strong, strapping man from England. <laughs> also, my favorite woman novelist ever. I'm not sure what that says about me. That's all right. I think, yeah, Charlotte Bronte is my favorite, so. This is a good choice. Yeah. I really, uh, Charlotte did Jane Eyre, right? You know, I recently found myself in a conversation. You know how, like, whenever you, if you, you get in a, you get in an argument with, with a woman about writers mm-hmm. and they'll, like, accuse you of not having read any women writers. And I just started going down the list. It was like Catherine Ann Porter, Edna St. St. Vincent Millay. I named more than she could. And that's the only time in my entire entanglement with that woman that she ever backed down from an argument. And it's like, it's like, I got like, got like a win, you know? In so you read too many women. Yeah. Yeah. Like, no, she didn't even try that. That normally that's like more, yeah, she would flip it around, but no, she's just so thoroughly defeated so quickly that there was no time to change strategy. Yeah. Uh, when, when I first started dating my wife, a similar conversation came up, except she was totally right. Uh, cause I don't read women, yeah. uh, but we're, we're not here to talk about, uh, women either, unless you subscribe to the Shakespeare was a black transvestite. No, uh, no, no. I actually despise all of the, all of the Shakespeare was Anybody who says Shakespeare was anybody but a possibly crypto Catholic, upwardly mobile man from Western England who hit it big and did really well for himself and moved home and died is like really missing out on like all sorts of contexts. We're going to see people doing the, the, what is the one? The Oxford is the, the Earl of Oxford is the guy that they said. Yeah, or, uh, or Devere. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Whenever, yeah, whenever, whenever I hear that argument, I I feel kind of bad for the person making it because they have no, like, like they're so they they must be steeped with resentment. Yeah, it's, that it couldn't or, be them, or it's it's somebody like, like Curtis Yarvin will do it, but he's just trolls all the time. Like he's like literally always trolling. But then like people like there's like real serious scholarship that were people just like obsessively try to prove that William Shakespeare wasn't real. And they'd be like, well, we don't have any doc- documentation or anything. But actually for his own time, Shakespeare is an incredibly well-documented person. Like we know all kinds of stuff about it. Right. Him. Yeah. <laughs> you know? and, and so, you know, for a guy, I guess he was the most famous writer who ever lived, but he wasn't a political statesman with, uh, you know, with a, a secretary or somebody kind of following him around and, and, or even somebody who would write a lot of letters that would be worth keeping, like, uh, you know, insert famous statesman king. Yeah, I mean, here, it, it, you know? it comes down to us, and actually, this is sort of relevant. Um, no, we're not. We're not totally off the. We're not. We're not totally off, uh, off in the weeds. That when you can think about Shakespeare, you have to conceptualize William Shakespeare as this guy. This is the guy he was. He was born into an upper middle class family in this town in England called Stratford. Um, Upper middle class was a new designation at the time, you know, or middle class itself was a, you know, relatively new designation at the time. Shakespeare was, he was the son of a local politician and a glove maker. And when this was presented to me at the ripe old age of 12 by brother Raymond Bouliard, you know, in, you know, in Catholic school, this was pointed out to me as something that we think of like craftsmen today as being like of a certain, you know, of a certain social milieu, but to be a glove maker um, is actually, it's sort of like being a goldsmith or silversmith. You're working with, you're, you're making things for actually the incredibly moneyed people. Gloves are expensive things, you know, and uh, he was well-educated 
this is one of the things that we can tell. And if you read, if you know Latin or you know Greek or you know the era very well, you can tell that Shakespeare's this guy who uh, he you could tell he knew Latin really well. He probably knew Latin better than me. He had been exposed to Greek. Um, probably he didn't know Greek very well. But the other things that would have gone along with this are um, instruction in, in when England in the 16th century. This would have gone along with instruction in the two most important living languages of communication in Europe. And that was French and the other one was Italian. Okay. Mm -hmm. And when he goes to London and he starts writing these plays, it's easy. People will tend to want to think about, and this is where you get in a dangerous place and you can get in a dangerous place possibly by imagining too much Hamlet in in Shakespeare himself, that he's this like sort of isolated artist figure that's producing these incredible works out of his own mind. And he's really not, you know, these, a lot of these, a lot of these stories are coming to him in these, uh, from these chat books that would be unloaded when the merchants in Southampton and the merchants in, you know, down on the Thames river would come in from Italy they would have their cargoes and they would also have these books. They would also have these texts, you know, these, these periodicals uh, that they would bring in from Italy or wherever it is they went and they would sell them, but they wouldn't really go for much. And they would quickly replicate themselves and get passed around London. So that's where he's reading. That's where he's reading these stories. Uh, and this is one, also the reason why, if you think of the other Elizabethan playwrights, it's also important to remember that there are other Elizabethan playwrights. There's Marlowe, there's, you know, there's Thomas Kidd, there's all these other people. And that all, frequently when one of, when one of, and they all knew each other, you know, they all drank, they all drank together. And though they frequently will tell versions of the same story uh, under slightly different, you know, so like uh, Shakespeare has the Merchant of Venice and, you know, I think Kid has the Jew of Malta and they're almost the same story. So this is like a thing is about the way Elizabethan theater works is that, you know, instead of seeing Star Wars, instead of having Star Wars at every cinema in, uh, you know, Elizabethan London, there's no electronic, there's no mechanical reproductions of works of art yet. So you actually have to get a whole new acting crew and to go to all these different theaters. And if you're going to do that, why is, you may as well do different variations on the story as well. And Hamlet is one of these stories that comes to us. We know this story comes from a chat book that was loaded, that was lo packed into London from uh, Italy, where it had been circulating as this very relatively short, brutal revenge assassination story out of Denmark. Uh, it had been circulating for about 100 years. And it's, it's it's not an unknown story, you know. This is the there would have been other versions of Hamlet that were being produced in Elizabethan England as well. This is just the one that comes down to us because it's because it's Shakespeare's, you know. And I mean, yeah. To be fair to Marlowe and to Kid, uh, you know, we don't know them as well because of how gigantic Shakespeare was. He really. I mean, if people can name a, a 15th century or 16th century read or rather, uh, they'll name Shakespeare maybe these days, uh, yeah. unfortunately. And, uh, Who knows what you're going to get these days. Yeah, exactly. It's like, oh, uh, you know, uh, oh, who's the guy that wrote uh, the Da Vinci Code? Isn't he? George Washington. Washington. Yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, he just, he, he was like a black hole for all other creatives of the time. Uh, in terms of of uh, notoriety, yeah, you know, that's that's power. That's true, and you know that itself is also it's a bit of an anomaly that's almost that's also bound up in the legend of Hamlet. Okay, because you know Shakespeare dies. I mean, he's he's not penniless. He's you know he's not he's a there's no like starving artist story here. He he's not Poe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's not poor. He doesn't die in a gutter. He actually is very successful almost immediately whenever he starts writing plays. And he makes enough money to uh, he makes enough money to purchase himself a patent of nobility. And then he, you know, promptly expires. He doesn't really have any sons, so his you know, his, his name dies out. But um, one of the things I thought he had a son, Ham Hamnet. 
you know, mm-hmm. the, the Puritans come in and they ban the theater in Jacobean, in Jacobean England. And so there's no playwrights for a while. And whenever, when the restoration happens, um, Shakespeare was a favorite of this crypto Catholic element that's that in that exists within Shakespeare was a favorite of the restored Stuart monarchy. And so when plays start being produced in London again, Shakespeare is the house favorite. Okay. And that's where he really, you know, that's, that's where his, his, his notoriety starts to grow again after he dies. And, uh, if you, it's interesting because you can watch, you can read literary criticism from the 18th century. Samuel Johnson pays some attention to him, but it's clear in the 18th century that Shakespeare is just one among many English writers. Um, and it's not actually until the 19th, the late 18th century and the 19th century that you start to get this really reverent attitude towards Shakespeare specifically. And that is largely a result not of Shakespeare himself but of uh, Samuel Taylor Coleridge who's mm. who's who's critical works on him which really do a lot for establishing the aesthetic of romantic of the ro- of romance in English literature are uh, they're brought to bear uh, they're brought to bear on this one guy Shakespeare and so he, Coleridge's essays on Shakespeare end up creating the sort of religious fervor that exists around Shakespeare, you know, all the way to this day. That's so would, would, would you say that he saw Shakespeare as a proto-romantic? Um, I, you know, it's hard to say where we saw Shakespeare, because Coleridge would not have thought of himself as a romantic. You know, he like, thinks of himself as this guy who's doing these things. And he did... And Elliot, to bring Elliot up, Elliot complains in another essay, an essay we're not going to talk about, about Coleridge as the critic. Okay, and he he explains that he picks out picks two people. It's uh, Algernon Charles Swinburne and uh, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, and he picks them out as dangerous examples of critics. And he says that one of the worst things that you can do as either a critic or as a creative is to get your peanut butter and your chocolate or your chocolate and your peanut butter. Okay. So mm. one of the, you know, he's, he, his point is that it's very dangerous for someone with a creative turn to start getting creative with their criticism and start reading things into these texts that aren't necessarily there. And this is the basis of his argument contra Hamlet ultimately ends up being that this is what he thinks Coleridge is doing. He thinks Coleridge yeah. is finding and romantic and Goethe too, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He thinks he thinks Coleridge is finding romantic brilliance in this botched text. And that's the you know that's usually that's my default position on him. But we'll, you know, we'll get into it. So okay. And, and and thank you for setting that up. I think maybe we should take a step back and, and talk about the play itself and then we can kind of get into thoughts about the play right just yeah. just in case anybody here didn't pass high school and have to read hamlet in high school and is completely unfamiliar with uh with hamlet uh the story of the prince of denmark his uh his inquiry into the death of his father uh as you know it, it started out as oh everybody thinks that he just died of natural causes his ghost actually appears which I definitely want to talk about that. I think that's probably the, the seminal, like that. that's the most important part of the play in my mind, right? But anyway. Uh, it's, the, it's certainly, it's the, again, the reason I brought up all these other versions of Hamlet, you know, Ur Hamlet, so on and so forth. This is, there are, very, there are actually very few things that Hamlet, I mean, that Shakespeare adds to this story. And the ghost is And the is ghost is the one. one. Yeah, and, the ghost yeah. is one of them. Well, all right. I mean, let's get into it now, then, um, and we'll 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 kind of move from there. So, uh, Ham, the ghost of King Hamlet appears outside the ramparts of the castle. Hamlet sees him, right? Or he's he's stirred awake by some guards who are like, you know, tell the prince, right? Well, okay. What the thing is, is this is you know this opening is this is Shake this is probably Shakespeare's most legendary opening. The opening lines: "Who goes there?" Okay, or you know, "Who's there?" 
Okay, and this is a line that's spoken by these guards, and this is this ambiguity sets in immediately. This ambiguity that makes me bang on the table sets in immediately because we have this foggy, we have this foggy night on this on this Danish rampart, and the king's son is home from college. Is this basically what's going on here? Yep. Yep. And he's and he's and he's hanging out on these he's hanging out on these ramparts. And the guards hear something and they say, who's there? You know, who goes there? And we're left to interpret whether or not it's Hamlet or it's the ghost of Hamlet's father. You know, there's like, there's so many, there are a number of points where we're invited actually to clear up the ambiguity of the story on our own. And we may not even think, because we may read this play, we may read this play or watch this play too procedurally, and we may not even think about it. But there's already psych psychological stuff going on from the very first line. Is the ghost there, or is it just Hamlet? They keep going. Right, and that's that's the question that we we the audience are, are made to ask ourselves, especially if you if you come from the, uh, I guess I guess the the most recent uh, sort of standard bearer for this for this type of thinking is uh the late great harold bloom uh who who believes that shakespeare like in he, his book is called shakespeare the invention of the human which i always found super pretentious uh but then that's that's bloom anyway uh so yes so hamlet it has a the, the ghost and hamlet have entreat with one another and the ghost explains that he cannot, he, the ghost, King Hamlet, cannot go to heaven. He is stuck in purgatory, and the only way out of purgatory for him is revenge, right? Which, which is, it's weird that this is the part that is added to, or that Shakespeare adds, because that is a very Italian or Spanish sort of plot line. Let's say this, let's just use the C word, it's Catholic. Yeah, yeah okay, yes, well, it is very, it's very, but I was thinking more Mediterranean, because it's not, it, not so much French, you know, you, you wouldn't see that in, like, the north, in the northern Catholics. It's yeah, very it's Mediterranean. True. Is it's what true. I, I, and, you know, this is, this picks up some valences that people have thrown this, thrown this shade at Shakespeare, you know, over the last few centuries, is that he was not only a crypto Catholic, but he may because his father was definitely a Catholic. You know, just to contextualize what was going on in England at the time, the English Reformation is occurring, mm. and uh, it's not by any means as violent as the Reformation is on the continent. But it's not five, the Thirty Years' War, definitely. Yeah, there's five like five hundred total people recorded in the book of Fox's Book of Martyrs, and that's a that's a you know that's that's a bad morning in Germany. Okay. And, uh, but yeah, they're, they're, they're in, in Germany, uh, in the 30 years war, there are like entire regions that are just wiped out of people. Yeah. 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 But there is this, there is this shadow that hangs over Shakespeare that, you know, his father was a crypt. His father was one of these Catholics who was, uh, actually attending Catholic services in secret churches mm -hmm. in England. And, Though there are no outward, there are no official outward, pro, you know, projected signs of Catholicism in Shakespeare himself. He's obviously a good Protestant boy and he ends up working for the Queen. But there are these little Easter eggs that he hides in it. And this revenge plot, because Protestant, especially Puritan, especially the, the, the branch of Puritanism that's growing in England at the time, would not would not condone a revenge plot for getting into heaven. And this is the kind of stuff that get this is the kind of stuff that gets the theater banned, in fact. You know? So, yes. Yeah. And very well said. And the thing that the thing that sort of caught me up with this is obviously one, that's just that's also not how purgatory works. Right? Uh I I'm not Catholic. I was raised Catholic and I know basically what purgatory is but I, i'd probably mess up uh, a, a doctrinal explanation but one soul is released from purgatory with with prayer for mercy from god yeah I, purgatory is per, per, what's the, the latin is there's purgatorius 
And this is the purgatory is a place that you have to go to atone for your own sins before you can enter paradise. Okay. It's a cleansing process. Yeah, 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 you're yeah. cleansing your soul. Uh, and in, because, you know, obviously you one sin cannot be in the presence of God. Right. So you need to be sinless in order to get to heaven. Right. Makes sense. You know, somewhat. Right. Uh, we won't get into that. Um, so my thought on this play it, that it is a Catholic play one, because there's this debate as whether or not uh, Hamlet is a Catholic play or a Protestant play, but that this is actually a demon disguising himself, trying to trick Hamlet, right? Trying to get him to sin, right? Trying to corrupt the ruler or the future ruler rather of the kingdom, right? And that okay. all of Hamlet's, all of Hamlet's uh, deeds after all his his kind of whining and moaning, yes and no, should I, shouldn't I, is his soul grappling with the idea of committing a murder, and and he fails. He commits murder at the end, and the kingdom is destroyed. Basically, uh, you know, the entire royal family is wiped out, and it's only the the sort of godly king Fortinbras that can bring order back to Denmark. Okay, now that is, now I remember you giving me this. Is this your homebrewed reading? I can't remember. This is homebrewed. I, 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 there, there's a, there's a, um, a Twitter user named Bolingbroke and then also William Wheelwright. It's one of those two that I think kind of uh, brought this up in a Twitter space once and yeah. that just kind of stuck in my mind and I, I spun out from there. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a challenging reading. Okay, this is like, uh, of all of the arguments that I've heard against my hatred for Hamlet, that actually countenances some complexity in the play that I haven't accounted for. So that, but it's, that, but it's there. there. It's, you know, I'm not, I'm not pulling anything out of whole cloth, you know. Right, right, right. No, no, I'm saying that's, that's a good reading. That, that, that is an interesting reading that I have never countenanced before. So yeah, that's, that, is, that, that is fascinating. You know, my complaints about Hamlet, I just we'll go, like run through them. And yeah, go ahead, let's do it. My complaints are T.S. Eliot's complaints, more or less. And like Eliot is also, I mean, this is, I, actually, you know, I'm just going to stop and just, just tell everybody the greatest, the single greatest book of literary criticism ever written it's called The Sacred Wood, and it's it was written by T.S. Eliot when he was, I guess he was probably about 26, 27 years old. It's a collection of relatively short essays where that don't really have any rhyme or reason to them. There's no, like, thematic grouping or anything. It's like he just, like, was, like, ripping pages out of his notebook, and he said, this can make a book. Um, his the, the essay, the Eliot prose that most people have to read at some point in their lives – Though I guess not anymore because it's just wildly conservative and it's wildly reactionary. No, no, and, we can't uh, read Elliot, folks. Yeah, it's a uh, uh, tradition in the individual talent. Whenever we, it's just the one where he, he he gives his own definition of tradition. That's in the Sacred Wood. Another one of the essays in the Sacred Wood is called Hamlet and His Problems. Mm. And uh, and in this essay, he. And Elliot's always doing stuff like this. He's always he's always poking poking people just to poke them. But he takes on this idea of Hamlet as actually a failed play. And now the reasons he lists it as a failure is because he says that, you know, Shakespeare doesn't bring anything really to this play except the mother narrative, the, the, um, you know, the, the muling around the mother and he's and he like attempts to read this in a Freudian way. He says mm. the only thing the only thing Hamlet really brings to the table in terms of narrative complexity is that it adds this mother, this Freudian Oedipal mother complex that doesn't really add anything to the play and actually actually interrupts its flow, makes it needlessly complex. And then he has some technical. He has some technical complaints. Yeah, it would be. It, it would be. It would have been more straightforward had had Gertrude. Had there been no Gertrude, even if, right, if it right. was just Claudius taking the throne. 
yeah, we use it's hard to imagine a movie that's been made better by women speaking. But the you know, <laughs> I, I, I didn't I didn't say that. I didn't, you didn't hear that from me. But well, the, we'll edit it out in post. <laughs> but um, the there's there, there are there's two women here. There's Ophelia and there's and I'll get to Ophelia in a minute because this one is a real personal problem. The real personal problem I have. Yeah, um, yeah Ophelia is. I hate the word problematic, but it it, it does feel she she feels so um, flat. Well, or, I mean, nonsensical is there are some nonsensical aspects to her. But I mean, on the other hand, she's literally the first BPD art hoe. Okay, <laughs> you know, okay, and there you know there are some there are some things going on with Hamlet. Okay, so first of all, the technical problems. Hamlet is given to uh, we have this question of his sanity. And to refer back to that first line, who goes there? All right, is there is there a ghost there? Is there a demon there? Is there nobody there? Is Hamlet just crazy? Okay, and to to Elliot, that's not a fair line. It's not a fair line to put in something that you know he thinks should be obeying the Aristotelian unities uh, of, of drama. He says this breaks the rules. Mm -hmm. This is like if you if you've ever read if you ever read. Um, if you, if you ever spend much time with detective fiction, you know, you're familiar with Agatha Christie. There's two right. books in which Agatha Christie breaks the rules of detective fiction. And she does it in Murder in the Orient Express, and she does it in The Murder of Roger Ackroyd. And these are which, considered... Which I did cover on this show. Did you? Oh, man. Yeah. I don't know if I can listen to that one. <laughs> the, um, but he breaks... You know, so the, the argument is that, is that Hamlet is actually wildly disorienting and possibly morally damaging to audiences because of this trickery that Shakespeare is somewhat cheaply adding into the story with all of these, all of these asides, all of this ambiguity. And the asides is the tendency to break the fourth wall where Hamlet looks directly at the crowd, sometimes with other actors on stage, sometimes with other characters on stage and starts speaking directly to the audience and then not being totally honest, you know? Okay. This is the, so we have this question. This is, this is, he's just, He's, they say he's, he's got this revenge story. And the only thing he's really added to it is this weird mother story, this weird mother plot. And then he fucks with the audience. And he's, you know, uh, Elliot's argument is that this is just more or less unfair. And then also, whenever you, if you look at it, and this is, you know, Hamlet is very famous for this very, for these, for these long soliloquies. That we know, you know, to be or not to be, that is the question, you know, uh, you know, whether it's just nobler in the mind and stuff, just slings and arrows of outrageous force, you know, like all that this two sullied flesh would melt, you know, there's four of them, and there's four of them are really long, and they're not that complicated to us to read today, but they introduce an incredible level of what could potentially be read as narcissism. Yes, into this, into this. I, I think that, as well as even, and it, it's funny the the episode I did before this was Macbeth, so it's it's weird that uh, Macbeth is exactly the opposite. Macbeth to me, Macbeth is the perfect play. You I, you're gonna you're gonna like the episode that I did uh, when yeah. <laughs> this is already out. Everybody who's listening is gonna love it. Adam and I, I think, did a great job. But I, I bring up Hamlet actually as in that episode as sort of the anti Macbeth. Yeah. Or maybe Macbeth is the anti Hamlet, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the one thing that I really dislike about Hamlet that I like in Macbeth is is that there is a sense of narcissism even from from Shakespeare. The fact that he adds the the uh the play of no consequence, by the way, in the middle of it. He's like um Oh yeah, being being a playwright is like the most important thing you can be. It, it's it's the the punk rock of his day. Like you know, like yeah. you know, those those the shitty punk rockers. Like man, everything's punk rock, you know. And and if you're not making punk rock, you're not a real musician. Yeah, you know that that's what I get from Shakespeare reading, uh, the, the uh, when Hamlet puts on a play to to determine Claudius's guilt. Yeah, no. This is uh, this is the second time, to my knowledge, that, that I can think of offhand that Hamlet's done this. He does it famously in *Midsummer Night's Dream*, where there's a play with that yes, play. yes, *Midsummer's Night's Dream* as well is, uh, but a, a bit indulgent, one could say. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this, like, this idea, yeah, this is like he's the conceit, the establishment of what we might refer to as the artist's personality, which I am in possession of, and I can tell you it's not necessarily stable and it's not necessarily very productive, and it's maybe not. Um, maybe not the greatest thing to turn yourself into in the world as a self-conscious artist. Hamlet has definitely done that and possibly Shakespeare has as well. And he's like, he's, you know, he's established, you know, the, 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 the concept of the thought experiment or the fictional thought experiment inside the play to determine the guilt or innocence of a man who may or may not have uh, killed his brother who may or may not have come back as a you know purgatorial ghost to haunt him okay that's an incredible amount of complexity and maybe it's too much <laughs> you know <laughs> now no okay now i need you to be completely honest here not that you have ever been anything more than honest to me but right. when i read hamlet when we talk about Ophelia, who is the the first manic pixie dream girl, BPD Arto, right? Yeah. I read this play and I'm like, oh, this is this is my friend Chris Sandbach. Yeah, yeah, I can, like, okay. Like, right. like, how, oh my god, how I much, like... how much of that is is coloring your distaste for the play? Do you think? <laughs> oh man, I didn't think you were gonna get to that till the very end. I thought you were gonna drop that one on me at the very end. No, I... no, no, no. I want to get into it now. This is what the people want. They wanna they wanna see you. Uh, uh, unburdened. Yeah, what better person to ask about the quality of Hamlet as a character than Hamlet? Is disturbingly <laughs> similar to Hamlet in his own right. Yeah, that's there's you know as it's like oh god, there's this self hatred streak that runs through you that you know may not be very healthy. And you know there's some truth like my okay my all right my my issue. Well, this is my ultimate issue with Hamlet. This is my issue with Hamlet is that he has Ophelia. He has the perfect woman. <laughs> I am Hamlet. I know that Ophelia is the perfect woman. And he kills her? He lets her run off and kill herself? No, I don't believe you, Billy. I don't believe that, you. That, 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 from what I know of you, that tracks. Oh, my God. No, that's like, yeah, I never, you know, this conversation we just had before we started. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um. Letting the girl get away. I let the girl get away. I don't let her die. You well, know? I mean, he didn't know that she was going to do that. He's slowly, I mean, he's, no, he's, I've got, I'm going to have to dig up the text now. He's like inching her into it. You know, he's like, he is, this is, and here was, this is another, what is, we have these complaints about, it's super easy in Shakespeare to go to somebody who I defend stodgily. I defend Iago in Othello stodgily. I said, look, this is the most under misunderstood character in Shakespeare. He's actually, he's not this awful racist character. He's actually a Spanish patriot carrying the, re carrying the Reconquista into the foreign court at the, you know, in, in, in Venice. And that Iago has good goals. Like Iago is a patriot. He's a virtuous man. He's a virtuous Spaniard. Hamlet, on the other hand, we find him weaving, we find him weaving his best friends, the love of his life, into these 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 word clouds is essentially what they are. You know, he look like, nobody's gonna say that no nobody's gonna say Ophelia's father is the you know, nobody's gonna say Polonius is the best guy in the world. But does he really deserve to be just taunted all the time? You know, does he, you know, does He's... his daughter deserve to be, you know? Actually, he does this thing to Hamlet. He does this thing to Ophelia that this, the, this most recent woman, the one we were just talking about, did, would do to me all the time. She gives, he gives, and then he withdraws. He gives, and then he withdraws. He gives, and he withdraws. And even if you come to the conclusion that this is art or something like this, the word, I feel like the best we can say about this is this is very feminine behavior from him. Mm. No, I, I would agree with that. This is very feminine behavior from this man who we are also supposed to believe is on a righteous campaign of vengeance to save his father's throne and become the and become the king of Denmark. So what are we doing now? Are we are we are we devaluing kingship? 
is that what we think Shakespeare is doing here? He's saying that any, like any, like any, like sensitive young man can be the king of England, the, the king of Denmark. I don't know. Um, but that, all of that, more or less, I, my, I, I follow along with Elliot and I have, you know, I can see in my mind a version of Hamlet that is, you know, a killer play. It would never achieve the momentous heights that, you know, Coleridge has taken it to, has, has taken it to, but it would be formally a better play. And I would like to point out that Eliot is not so jaded as to not give us a replacement Shakespeare for Hamlet, and he offers instead he offers uh, Antony and Cleopatra mm-hmm. as the as the as the, the stand-in for Hamlet. And I think if you go, and that would be a fun one to do a talk about as well. And there's there's no mother plot in Antony and Cleopatra, <laughs> right? Yeah, there's no yeah there's no mother plot. <laughs> It's just chads and hot babes. <laughs> um, but those are ultimately the grounds on which I would contest Hamlet. And then the other thing, the other thing about Hamlet that sort of gripes me is that I think, and this is a meta, this is a meta problem, okay, is that I think Hamlet, I think the, the very feminine aspects of Hamlet um, appeal curiously to the type of person that ends up teaching Hamlet, which is the, you know, the sort of cat lady industrial conflict. Mm, yeah. Is, uh, yeah. It is, it is a very, it's the, the play of the longhouse. Yeah. 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 That is the, the, you know, the, the junior high. Cause I think it's when those people are, ex- what is, is Hamlet? <laughs> I is wonder, Hamlet I wonder if JD Vance hates Hamlet. Yeah. This is like JD Vance and C Sandbach take on Hamlet. But the, uh, the, it, 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 Hamlet's a high school play, I think, isn't it? It's not yes. a yeah. Okay, so yeah, like the 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 high school history teacher lady who like she's got a degree in English, but she probably hadn't really, you know, it might have been 20 years ago. She doesn't read much now, but like she was very impressed by Hamlet. And over the course of repeatedly teaching Hamlet year after year, she's become more convinced that Hamlet is this brilliant, incredibly complex tapestry of themes and characters. And that she may, in fact, be running away from what we might consider to be good, you know, a good viewing material as opposed to real. Have you ever seen Hamlet performed? Uh, no, I have not. I've seen Hamlet performed once. And it, Hamlet was black. So this might have, you know, colored, you know, colored it for me. But, you know, my experience seeing Hamlet performed live is that it's long. It's, it, yeah. too, it's too long. Okay. Um, it's too long. There's too many lines. There's too, there are too many things kept going at once. Shakespeare only attempts two that are more complex. One of them is King Lear. I don't really like King Lear either, but I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to complain about King Lear in the same way that I would complain about this one. And the other one is Richard the third, which, uh, in my opinion, deals with a lot of the same themes that Hamlet deals with but is better because of the clean ending, you know, like well, Richard and, and he was really evil, you know? Yeah, and he, he was, he had to stay within the lines of, of history and taste. Whereas, uh, you know, with Hamlet, he could kind of do what he wanted. Yeah. He's allowed to run wild. And I think that's what he did. I think he ran wild. I think he ran too wild. And I'm glad you brought up, I think you brought up Macbeth as the audience. Yes. Macbeth to me is just the, is the most perfect, tight little narrative that is like, you know, that, 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 you know, that was perfect Trumpism right there. But the, the, uh, the, is this perfect title. Big play, narrative. the best. <laughs> that, 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 that just, it, you know, it springs itself forward. It's very linear. We can always tell what's going on, mm. and you know the the lines between good and bad are, you know, remarkably well drawn. And I, I and I think to... I think even Eliot says as much. Uh, yeah. He he looks at Macbeth favorably, where he where he looks down on Hamlet. Yeah, um, that's the that's the you, you you caught me. That's the that's the that's the classic the classic opposition. Um, but you know, there's a, when you're asking about me, how much is this personal? I personally tend to favor like man who shot Liberty Valance tier Westerns. Like, you know, like, Oh, I, really, I mean, yeah, that's like, Oh, I like one of the best Westerns ever. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's the best one ever, but, the, uh, but 
What do you, what do you, oh yeah, no, you're the, you're a searchers guy. Yeah, well, I love the searchers. I mean, both John Ford, uh, I, I, I unforgiven, I think is, it should be in the conversation just because, uh, well, Wait, it's, what, that's also, that's also unfair. Uh, you, because without all the other Westerns before it, Unforgiven doesn't make sense. Oh, that's true. Yeah. Uh, Josie Wales is up Josie there, but Wales. that's your favorite Civil War film. So. You know, he, you know, the guy that wrote Josie Wales was the speech writer for George Wallace. I did know that. <laughs> I think you told me that before. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Shane. Shane. Which, which, oh, God. Which, I've never which, seen the movie Shane. Oh, uh, dude. If you love Liberty Valance, you're going to love Shane because it's it's similar but different. Yeah, right? yeah. I, mean, Where, I know Shane is a Confederate veteran. Yes. If yes. The implication. Yes. That, well, yeah, there's, there's, because there's also, um, uh, what's what his name? He's a, he's a character actor. He's in everything. He, uh, anyway, uh, he plays a guy named Stonewall Tory and he just gets murdered in the middle of the street by uh jack palance uh and it's a it's a great film i, I highly recommend it but i would I, it's it's like liberty valance except uh ransom there's no ransom character right it's just uh the the gunslinger from out of town who solves the town's issues and then actually has to go it's a lot like ajax um uh, which again covered on the show with Athenian Stranger. Go listen to the Ajax episode, folks. Uh we we make Greek tragedy uh relevant for the modern day. Uh but yeah I'd I'd say Shane uh or or the searchers. You know, like I I'm I'm really famous for, for for taking these like taking these incredibly strong positions on the internet and then whenever people haul me into a space to actually talk about them, I'll bleed them down somewhat. The, the Mott and Bailey school of sandbagism. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but the, there are, okay, look, there are things in Hamlet, because I'm like, I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm looking at this. You know, I'm, I'm sitting here looking at this right, right now. And I, I, you know, astrologically. You're, lo- you're, you're looking at the Catholic angle, man. You're looking at, you're I, like, I damn, am, damn, the, Hudson's got something here. No, no. I mean, that was actually more kryptonic for me than I thought it was going to be, because you, you, you ran straight to a place that I love. Which is the political with the political implications of of Catholicism and Protestantism in English history, and so, so yes, the, yes, exactly. Though that's the thing that I was spinning my wheels about for months, and uh, and and that reads right. In fact, as you were introducing it, I was thinking to myself, I was like, "This is very Catholic. This is a very Catholic plot. That's interesting. I hadn't seen that before," and you know. This idea that he's being tempted into sin by a demon. I'm actually writing something. Like when you messaged me to hop on here, I was writing something about a William Faulkner novel in which the same sort of thing happens. It's, I don't know if you read the, the read the thing I published yesterday. It was on the I did. Pond. I loved it. Yeah, it was on the wild. And I'm, there's a follow up coming. And um, the the Wild Palms is a story that, and I yesterday I characterized it as a thought experiment as to whether or not two people can you know, isolate themselves entirely in the world and build a life out of pure passion. And there was something, and I hadn't read the book in like 13 years before I, you know, before I started writing about it, it just, it, it entered my life suddenly. And I, and I was forced to revisit it, but there was something in this book that I didn't notice before that really started to sort of bother me because and it interrupted my idea of this is a pure thought experiment which is these 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 italicized thoughts that the doctor harry has uh the doctor harry's a poor doctor and he's he's living he's 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 on the straight and narrow he's on the righteous path remember this book is called if i forget the jerusalem he's on the straight and narrow he's on the righteous path uh he's building his family up that has sacrificed a lot to send him to medical school and he's poor in medical school in new orleans but he sends two dollars a week to his sister back in oklahoma okay and then he meets this woman and he starts spending these two dollars a week on lunch at galatoire's okay and this repeatedly enters the italics of his mind as something that he knows he shouldn't be doing Okay, like he knows that there is a virtuous path in front of him and that he is straying from it. And he's thinking to himself, there will be penalties for straying from this path. And when you brought that up, 
I thought this about Hamlet as well. I'm like, okay, he sees this thing. And now, and I, all of my opposition to the, to the sanity question, I'm like, oh, it doesn't really matter if Hamlet is sane for this to be, you know, he might just be. He, he he's just conflicted. Be if he yeah. is the sensitive young man. Yeah, yeah, he's just he, a he's, sensitive young man. I see him. I see him as a man who should not be a king. Right or could be could become a great king, with with decent sort of. Uh, see, it's the, the th chapel perilous, man. Okay, it's the but, it's but the, the thing that the great and the reason that sin and and the, a demon can even come into Denmark is because Claudius kills his brother. Right. Yeah. Claudius okay. not only ruins the kingdom, right, for his own selfish gain, much actually like Macbeth kind of does. Right. Right. Uh, but he's also ruined his nephew because now his nephew does not have the father figure he needs to become a strong ruler. Right, right. Okay, so now we're reading, now we're reading Hamlet. Now this, okay, now this is a, throw T.S. Eliot out the window. So now we're, now. Bye, Tom. See you later, Tom. But yeah, the, the, and you'll never hear me say that ever again. I, I'm going to go, I'm, I'm, I'm already turning the car around. I'm like, I didn't mean it. I didn't mean it. But the, <laughs> now get in, get in, Tom. Come on. <laughs> yeah. But now we're reading Hamlet as the, the apparition, this apparition exists. Okay. Now there's no question now whether or not this apparition exists. There's a question whether or not the guards can see the apparition, but this is clearly something that the subjective persona Hamlet is experiencing. And, and, and it's a temptation. Okay. And, and then, you know, we can like read some of these lines. We can read some of this torture in Hamlet now, you know, uh, you, to the, with, you know, the slings of arrows of, of arrows of outrageous fortune or take arms against the sea of troubles then by opposing end them to die, to sleep no more. And by to sleep to say, we end a heartache and thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to, to the consummation, you know, and that is all memorized by the way. I'm not. I'm, oh, no. I, and, and that's, I'm really glad that you're you're doing this for memory because I think it does give you authority to to then <laughs> say, oh Hamlet Hamlet's no good. <laughs> oh, but Shakespeare's easy to read out loud and get right. You know the the insolence of office and the spurns that patient merit of the unworthy takes when he himself might his quietest take. You know that's the the. Shakespeare made it easy for us. He put it in iambic pentameter. You just have to speak like you normally. Eng natural English is in iambic pentameter usually. You know, but whenever we that we're looking and this is the really, you know, this is the really famous soliloquy when he's speaking to Yorick. And I, I like when I'm really angry about Hamlet, I will say that the only two sympathetic characters in Hamlet are Yorick and Ophelia. The, the, <laughs> because Yorick has to sit, the skull has to sit there and listen to this little kid. Dead, you know, um, not even in death can he be left alone. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But. You know, we have this 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 question now where Hamlet is aware that this thing that he this thing whose uh, whose influence he's operating under might be a demon. Okay, and now there's an internal narrative that's not a mother narrative, that's not a made up narrative, that is actually very real and it's squarely in the Sandbatch wheelhouse. Like the house is now we're talking about Hamlet as proto Southern Gothic. And that I have a hard time, you know, stepping away from. Now I have a, I have a, a, a brief aside, uh, one of many that we've done so far, but you know, what kind of phrenology did your Yorick have for Hamlet to be able to know that that was his skull? You know, I don't know. I, like, it's just like, I'd like to think that I'd be able to recognize my old best friend's skull if I saw it just lying around, but you know, maybe I wouldn't. But he's, he's not even, like, he's just the jet, the court jester. Right. Know? Like, and like the, he would, Hamlet would have a childhood affection for him the same way that you would for, I know what you're going to say. Just go ahead and say it. Like Barney the dinosaur. No, oh, I thought you were going to say old black housekeeper. Oh, oh well, I mean, yeah. Well, I, I'm a Yankee. I don't, I don't, I didn't, I never had that. But yes, he, he is, he's Aunt Jemima. Oh, that's, 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 that, that is literally the role he's playing. And you do see, oh my God, Fa Faulkner loves Hamlet. That's of course like, he did. yeah. And yeah, Faulkner loves Hamlet. He has a he, whole, uh, he has a whole thing called the Hamlet. Yeah, well, and that's true. And when he wrote, this is an apocryphal story. I don't know if this ha happened. He was uh, hanging out on Royal Street in the offices of a literary magazine called The Double Dealer. 
and <laughs> huh <laughs> and, yeah and uh and he uh, issue 13 now available yeah he was just laying around and some guy was in there reading hamlet out loud and Shakespeare, drunk, some New Orleans summer afternoon, wakes up from his stupor and go, tells him to shut up. And this guy is like, he's like, he's just like, this is Hamlet I'm reading. You can't stop me. And he says, I could write Hamlet in three weeks. And he goes home and writes The Sound and the Fury. <laughs> <laughs> that's the uh, story. But, you know, I'm. I you know, hope that's true. Yeah. Like, I, like, I want that one. I want that one to be true. But I mean, you know. Has anybody ever written up this 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 Catholic Protestant reading of Hamlet? So I'm sure they have. And you know, I, I there's nothing new under the sun. I have not no, read there a lot is, of though. There is. I'm we're gonna I'm gonna mute myself and look it up real quick. You can tell that's that's fine. I, I will say that there isn't, you know the, the the question that I have when it comes to this being a Catholic or a Protestant play, right, is also the like Sandbatch was mentioning earlier, the uh the political inquiry that that comes from that question right if if hamlet is a protestant play right we are we are automatically assuming that there is no hierarchy right that man is man has a direct connection to god that he does not need a great chain of being to converse with god so therefore he doesn't actually need a king you can't have a kingdom without Catholicism. At least that's that's the way that I've kind of thought about it. Uh, Sandbach, feel free to. Well, okay. Now that's like that's you. Yeah, you've spun directly into Sandbachism, and that the the you know the idea of kingship in Protestantism is very unstable. Um, the original justification for you know for the Church of England, and I'm a proud member of the Church of England, is that. Boo. Yeah, is that is that is that, is that the Pope? Um, the Catholic concept of kingship is that the Pope is the you know essentially the picker. He's wearing the big pointy hat. He gets to pick. He gets to he channels the legitimacy of God's chosen kingdom of God's chosen servant, uh, and lends his papal authority to the king. The Protestant usurpation or liberation, depending on the way you look at it, is disintermediating between the nation and the God figure. And so we arrive and this happens. The figure in England who does this is Henry VIII, who is Elizabeth's father, who is the who is and Elizabeth is the queen when William Shakespeare is writing all this shit. You know, so it's very politically dicey. Protestantism and kingship exists very uncomfortably near one another because then there becomes this question, well, if you can just knock the Pope out of the equation, then you can also just knock the king out of the equation and you can use uh, uh, an assembled body of legislatures, we might call them a parliament. You know, we could use a Lord Protector you know, we can use, we can, as soon as we... Exactly. Okay, Thomas Cromwell. And, and, and it's funny that Milton was a was a Cromwell guy. Because... I, I know, but but when you, when you read Paradise Lost... The greatest book ever written. It is, it is, it is, the devil is a... Thomas Cromwell would have done well with the devil. Okay, we're gonna come back when you when you get ready to talk about John Milton and Paradise Lost. Okay, we'll do yeah, we'll do I'm, it completely. Sorry, we're, 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 we we are we are getting into the weeds. Of yeah, yeah, it's fine. Uh, yeah, it's fine. We can, we'll, let's wheel back towards Hamlet though. Yeah, yeah, where are we at? But I, I'm I'm standing firm there. But okay, um, yeah. So when talking about it in terms of Protestantism versus Catholicism, you know, there there is no justification for monarchy if man is able to commune with God by himself. And and that's not exactly like what the high Lutheran church or what the Anglican church believes. Right. But that's what it's devolved into, especially in uh, the United States. Well, I mean, it did devolve that way in England and it was okay. These are okay. This, and I wrote, I think I'll, I'll republish it on the blog. I like to do these things and academic agent likes to do this too. And I think he would be real fun to talk to about this, but he's got me on his, 
ban less. But I like to look at Shakespeare plays. I can't imagine and, why. Yeah, and I, I can't and I like I like to look at Shakespeare plays in the context that they were written at that moment. So there's you know, uh I think it's the uh, much ado about nothing. There's a scene, there's like a there's this like Sylvan scene where all these little woodland goddess woodland creatures are forced to bow and pay homage to the king. Okay. That actually is Shakespeare writing about a contemporary political issue that was occurring at the so Elizabeth is about to have to go to war with Spain. And at the same time she has to go to war with Spain, John D's network of like internal agents start ringing the alarm bells and saying that the countryside is ate up with Spanish agents. And the, Sp and the Spanish agents they're referring to are usually these Robin Hood-like characters. And this is what Robin Hood is. Robin Hood is, the, the myth of Robin Hood is this, the, he's this, this older Catholic aristocrat who is like, so, and this is not contextually, and this is not contextually what Robin Hood is, but at the time when the Robin Hood myth became popular, this is the valence that's behind it. He's this old Catholic aristocrat who has been uh, usurped by a, an unrighteous King John. You know, John is always the king that gets thrown into the un, into the unrighteous stack when we're talking about kings in England. And well, when you have to follow Richard the Lionheart. Right, 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 and 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 what's going on here is that the Robin Hood is fighting a guerrilla war against the usurpation of the rightful Catholic nobility, and at a time whenever you know they're being disenfranchised in favor of these new money grubbers, these new you know these new Protestant gentry. Okay, and there's a similar thing going on in Shakespeare in this play where all of these little sylvan, all these sylvan creatures that are made to bow before the king are actually supposed to be these Spanish agents that are agitating in the back country in northern England, further from London, like further from Elizabeth's seat of power. And she actually has to go on, uh, she says she has to leave London and go on a procession through the countryside to ensure her authority, okay? Shakespeare loves writing about this kind of thing. And so like, like to, and this is a, this is a thing that, you know, like the, uh, the Harold Blooms of the world will do whenever they do something like invention of the human, they'll kind of demand Shakespeare. They kind of pull him out of his context, castrate him in a sense. He's like, very, he's, he's suddenly universalist. Right, right, right. Like I think like if you, if, if you, if you take Shakespeare out of his own political context, you may as well cut his balls out. Because he is speaking to a very specific audience all the time. And the thing that Shakespeare does better than anyone else, the thing he does better than all of his contemporaries, is he can layer a play in such a way that he can speak to three and four and five. Because, you know, in the actual construction of these theaters, there's the groundlings and then there's the people with the, you know, with the luxury boxes and everything. And they're all in, they're all there together in the same room. And Shakespeare was able to produce these plays that on one hand speak to the aristocracy and on the other hand speak to the groundlings at the same time. And he was able to pull them into a dialogue with one another through these mesmerizing performances that he puts on. And that that's where Bloom gets his you know, his invention of the human. This is, this is in fact, it's our arguably divine act. If somebody could come to America and do this right now, we could get rid of both Kamala Harris and Donald Trump. You know, this is the thing we're missing right They're now. The great unifier. Yeah. And, 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 and Shakespeare had this, had this ability and this, this question of kingship, this question of kingship and Protestantism. I actually think you've got this play nailed. I think this is, I think, I think I'm wrong. I'd like and then this you'll never hear me say I, I think I'm wrong again. Was, <laughs> Only on cannon fodder, folks. Yeah, but 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 I mean I think you're right because the more I think about this, okay, we have this question where and it's an ambiguous political question. What side is he actually taking here? This Catholic man, this Catholic man, or this this possibly crypto Catholic man who is taking this principled Catholic stand on behalf of the legitimacy of a monarchy for not only a Protestant monarch, but a woman Protestant monarch. Okay. And that is something that I think would be very, very interesting to wrestle with. And the idea of the idea of, of, of Hamlet wondering this, what is the justification for my authority? 
Is it my own righteousness? And if it's my own righteousness, then the most important thing I will ever do in my life is determine whether or not this thing talking to me is a demon. You know, um, I think that's a brilliant reading. <laughs> Thank you. There's a lot of talking. Sorry. No, no, definitely. And it, listen, I, I love hearing you talk about this kind of stuff. So uh, especially when you're agreeing with me. Especially uh, when you're agreeing with me. The the one the one caveat, right, to so so I was in a space with Astral, right, who was talking about Hamlet, and he brought up that Hamlet was studying uh at uh at uh, uh, what, uh, what college was he studying at? A very, uh, very Protestant college, uh, where Wittgenstein, I think, was was studying or what, or was like being read there. Uh, Wittenberg. It? Wittenberg, yeah. So, like, the fact that Hamlet is studying Protestant theology uh, in uh, has to be accounted for when reading this play. And that's one of the reasons that people think that it's a Protestant play is like, oh, you know, look, look at where he's studying. Of course, he's going to sort of question his need to act. He's he's conflicted about the, the whole idea of Catholicism in the first place. In, in that case, this turns into a don't send your kids to college. Child. Right. Yeah. 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 You know? don't, 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 send, don't send your nephew to college. He'll come back and murder you. <laughs> Oh man, now I want to go to Burning Man and put on Hamlet for a don't, bunch of don't like, go like LSD, LSD, LSD so, uh, Silicon Valley founders. You know, don't uh, you got hey, uh, Guildenstern, you, you guys are pretty cool. Uh, don't come to the castle tomorrow. Yeah, don't, yeah, yeah, Rosencrantz, Guildenstern, Rosencrantz, that's it. Don't okay, now I, I have a question about them actually because we were talking about the layering of, of Hamlet, of Shakespeare's work, right? It, it, it is. It is the melt. He was perfectly able to meld the high and the low, right? Uh, some, something yeah, there. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are frat bros. Exactly. I wanted to ask what the, their death, right? What is what? Because they're they're only in this for the comedic relief, right? They're they are the fodder. Well, they're in it to die too. Well, yeah, you know, but, but, I, but I just mean they're they're they are the fodder for the for the front row lower classes who are watching. Yeah, yeah, they 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 play the same role as Puck, essentially. Exactly, or uh, or the the porter in Macbeth. Yeah, and, yeah. Like, so, like, what or, is, who's the, who's the one in the Henry the Henry stories? Uh, starts with an F. Falstaff. Falstaff, yes, yes, Falstaff. So, so, what is the fact that he murders them, or he has them? Or Shakespeare has them murdered, right? Has yeah. them killed in the play. What, what is, what is he doing there? Uh, well, he's failing in this reading. He's failing. Okay, he's failing. You know, okay, and and you know that because the, the, when I say frat bros, I'm not even kidding. No, okay, no, you're literally not. Literally, what they are, and you this you. The establishment of sort of the fraternal, the fraternity lifestyle is well underway in England. I don't know if you know this, but uh, Henry VIII wrote songs and they're literally like college drinking anthems. Like he wrote this song called Pastime with Good Company and the, 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 uh, the directions for it are to get drunk and sing real loud together. Okay. So like this idea, and this actually, this ties into, this is a very interesting dovetail, but this is kind of what chivalry is becoming. Mm. You know, England, England has this, they have, these, they have this order of the garland, which was established by Henry II as, I think it was, maybe it's Edward III, actually. I think it was Edward III. Uh, Edward III establishes the order of the garter, which is this, it's still the most prestigious uh, society in existence in the world today, unless you have the good fortune to be born an American citizen. And, the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and um, the idea in this, in this English world, we're talking, you know, Shakespeare, the invention of the human. And if Shakespeare, you know, Harold Bloom, Antonin Scalia, Nick Land and I all believe that in order to be human, you have to first be English. And the, <laughs> the <laughs> famous Englishman, Antonin Scalia. <laughs> right, right, yeah. Oh, it's like, oh, you know, this is 
it's colorblind Englishness is what it is. And you know, the, the guy who taught me, the guy who, I, well, actually the guy who taught my Shakespeare undergrad course was uh, Leroy Percy, which is Walker Percy's youngest brother. But the guy who taught- Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah the guy who taught me uh, my undergrad English lit seminar, uh, my undergrad Brit lit seminar was a black man from Barbados who wore three piece suits. And uh, and was the most one of the most English people I've ever met, and it's just, it's just like I uh, I believe in colorblind Englishness now, but the um this idea of fraternal bonding of like of like of the fraternal of the virtue of fraternal bonding, of having these guys who like they know you're not feeling so good, and they came all the way out to the damn castle to check on you, and you have them killed. Okay, this is a good reading of someone who is losing a fight with a demon you know yeah okay. he's such a bastard he like i've hamlet really is a prick he well, I mean, he he's initially he's happy to see them and you know as somebody who's spent time around people that have like sort of like mental instabilities and they have like you know they they, they have a tendency to you know, they, they often seem as though they're under the influence of an external force. Like they'll they'll be fine one day, and then the next day, they'll want you dead. And that maps somewhat here. But I don't like mental illness or Hamlet is crazy because we do have this salient framework. And again, I'm gonna I'm actually gonna. If he's, to- he can't be he can't be crazy. He's he's plotting too much. Like he's. He, and he's too self-conscious. Well, I mean, if there's something there's something that I've noticed that crazy people do. It's plot a lot. Okay. Well, but, fair. But, right, I'll take that one back. Yeah. But all of a sudden now, this thing that has worked against Hamlet, against Hamlet the play, not against Hamlet the character, which is this this weird intermediation between himself and the audience. Well, now all of a sudden that becomes a strength of the play because now. The audience has seen the ghost. The audience has seen him be happy to see his buddies. The audience has seen what he does to Ophelia. And then he turns around and he tries to explain it to us. And it doesn't work. You know, it's this is like it, it's now all of a sudden, now the length of these soliloquies starts becoming, it's like this stammering man who's like who's increasingly coming up with these with these, with these reasons for why he's doing the things he's doing and it's not working. Okay. So now all of a sudden we start to rescue, we start all of these things that I've, that I've set up on a platter is the weaknesses of Hamlet. We start turning them around and turning them into strengths of Hamlet, you know? Uh, And that's, you know, that's to me, that's anything that's the, I'm a new critic. That's the, that's the kind of thing that I like to see is like, if you can take my list of things that I think are problematic about this text and you can show me how they act, how in the text themselves, how they're actually working towards a concerted reading of it, then that's as much as I can ask for. And I could, you know, like I'd, I'd give that essay an A. <laughs> Therefore I am better than T.S. Eliot. Therefore, yeah. The, you've heard it first. T.R. Hudson in Tom Eliot out. Now I we're, we're coming close to time, but I yeah. did want to ask you to expound on Ophelia, as I know that this is a project that is near and dear to your heart. <laughs> you know, there's a there's Bob Dylan. The, Bob Dylan's got a great song about. Well, Ophelia is again. Ophelia is more interesting. Ophelia is one of these characters who's more interesting again because of the romantic mythology yeah, around people. Her. People have really built her up. Well, you know, my favorite line in all of literature, and you have to like t- t- you have to you talk for like ten seconds while I look it up because I have to read it. Again. Yeah, the, the thing about Ophelia is that I, I think that people are more enamored with the idea of her because you know, again, people don't read, so they're they're getting sort of a a projection of projection of this romantic, this tragic romantic character. It's weird that. That people are latching on to Ophelia where they don't latch on to Juliet from Romeo and Juliet so much. Uh, well, even yeah. even though she's more, I, 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 maybe it's because Ophelia is is less. It, you can put you can project more onto Ophelia. She's less of a character. She is. She is less of a character. Juliet is very present. She is. There is okay, and maybe there is some some masculine issues here where that. The 
un, the unintegrated masculine. I've been real into Jung lately. The unintegrated masculine. The dragon we, of chaos. Yeah, well, two yeah, episodes chaos, in a row. Let's start yeah. chaos. Two, but, two uh, episodes in a row, two Shakespeare, two Jordan Petersons. I'm on a roll. Yeah, yeah. The but there is an argument possibly that the flat, the flatness of Ophelia's presentation, which may actually be a weakness of Hamlet, the flatness of Ophelia allows the unintegrated masculine to project his pure desire onto her. OK, which is something that we have a much more difficult time doing with Juliet, who is very present and very alive and has a lot to say, you know, okay. would, would, would you say would you then say that Ophelia is Hamlet's anima? Yeah, it's absolutely. This literally I was about to, I was about to see. I've read my young, too. Yeah, yeah, I've read, read my read my young, but this is just a, the Ophelia. OK, Ophelia is a character who and whenever we talk about you know, gender-based projections and phantasmic longings. The romantics are the people that we're talking about. And my favorite line about Ophelia that's ever been written is not written by Shakespeare. It's, in, it's on page three of, of, of Fyodor Dostoevsky's greatest novel ever written, The Brothers Karamazov. And he says, I knew a young lady of the last generation who after some years of an enigmatic passion for a gentleman whom she might have easily married at any moment, invented insufferable obstacles to their union, and ended by throwing herself one stormy night into a rather deep and rapid river from a high bank, almost a precipice, and so perished entirely to satisfy her own caprice and to be like Shakespeare's Ophelia. Indeed, if this precipice, a chosen and favorite spot of hers, had been less picturesque, if there had been a prosaic flat bank in its place, most likely the suicide would never have taken place. That's Ophelia. OK, <laughs> Ophelia is this this and Dylan writes about Ophelia and, you know, Dylan says Ophelia, she's neath the window. And, you know, so in his song Desolation Row, Ophelia is this character who is trapped on Desolation Row. You know, she's got all of the things, you know, she's got everything she needs. She's an artist. She don't look bad. And uh, she has this problem where she's trapped. She's trapped by these masculine figures. These masculine figures that inhabit this this place called Desolation, Desolation Row, and at the end of the verse about her, it says, you know, and though her eyes are fixed upon Noah's great rainbow, she spends her time peeking into Desolation Row. And the the it, the thing with Ophelia is that Ophelia is this in I think in almost every man's mind, there is this concept of this woman that is just perfect. Mm. You know, it is, she is quite literally. Perfect. She's the she's she fits she fits you like one of Shakespeare's dad's gloves does, and one of the deepest masculine fears I think is encountering this person, mm. because if you encounter this person, and this is very similar to the perilous chapel myth that I was I don't know if, I don't know if you're familiar with the perilous. I'm chapel. not. Please, please. Um, that'll be when we do the wasteland because I guess we can do the wasteland too. Oh, we can definitely but, do the wasteland. <laughs> This is I, I, this is not, I'm just inviting myself on sequential. I, I you can come on whenever I you, you're <laughs> top. You have the the keys to the city. <laughs> but so Ophelia, and if we we look at Ophelia this way, why does it, we need an argument? Why does Hamlet let her run off and die? Because the and this is again we have to look at Hamlet as a failing figure. He has no father figure. He has mm -hmm. no man that has brought him into the world and that has taught him how to be a man. And he is more comfortable sabotaging his relationship with this perfect woman that was raised to be his wife than he is either with the possibility of fucking it up or of seeing her with someone else. And so she has to die. That's a dark reading of Ophelia. That's... It's, it, it's, it, it's the reading that comes from deep in my soul. Yeah, I, I, damn, I resonate with that. Shit. <laughs> it did, didn't it? Yeah, it's gotcha. <laughs> uh, uh, time, time to go listen to uh, in the airplane over the sea again. Is that where is that where we're gonna leave off? <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, yeah. I usually try and try and end it on a good note, but uh, well, the good note is you convinced me that Hamlet's a good play. Yeah. 
yeah, there you go. All right, so so we've done it. I hope I've convinced you all. We'll try to, to do a comedy next time. We'll, yeah, we'll, we'll do. Uh, up the wasteland. We'll do, we'll do tri- uh, Titus on Dramacon. <laughs> yeah, we'll, 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 we've brought up the wasteland. It's like, oh, I'm going to do the wasteland with you. We'll do uh, Milton. We're going to talk about Satan. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, no, I, I wanted I wanted to do the care. Uh, we'll figure we'll figure out uh, what we do next time. Right, uh, right. Mr. Sandbatch, where can people find your work and how can they support you? you? I've started, you? Well, you know, I've started I've started doing this thing where, you know, because I'm because I'm I'm blue checked on Twitter, you know, because I generate revenue for Elon Musk and by extension, I guess Donald Trump now. But um Hey, you're helping us get to Mars. Yeah, right, yeah. So I, I I'm doing this new thing where what I'll do is I'll I'll publish my articles on Twitter. Um, and then I'll go over to the Substack and I'll produce longer form versions of them with footnotes and all of the fun stuff because, you know, I like the Substack platform, but the Substack platform's inability to integrate itself with Twitter is just obnoxious. And so I, the way I'm looking at this is I'm going to give you like I'm going to give you bonus points if you actually bother to go ahead and click over to the other website and read and read everything. But the Substack is Ecological Americana. I'm on Twitter at C Sandbatch. Um, and uh, just to plug some stuff that I've got, I don't know when you're going to release this, but I've got, I've done some shows with the Old Glory Club recently. I've done another show with Pete Canones recently. And I'm going to be on with Daryl Cooper pretty soon. Oh, so that's, that's going to be fun. Yeah, so that'll be fun. I'll make sure to link all those below. I'll make sure if it this this will probably come out. Uh, oh wait, yeah, and now I, I write now I write for I am seventeen seventy six. That's the big one. That's the big one. And I would again, I just want to plug I am t- I am seventeen seventy six. I went out to their I went out to their salon, their magazine release party, uh, and the salon with Nick Pizzolatto that was out in Austin. And look, look, guys, I'm gonna, like I don't know what the listening demographic is here and everything. I've been around the scene for 15 years. Okay, I've been going to I've been going to events for 15 years now, and I have never before until I went to the I am 1776 party in Austin. I have never before encountered a scene where young single men and young single women were in virtually one to one ratio. And to me, that is like, that is, that's winning. When the cute single women start showing up, that is when you're winning. And I think I am 1776 is incredibly well positioned right now to become sort of like the new modern age or the new gentleman's quarterly. It's a, it's a very good magazine. Granza is a good guy. Uh, he's very Italian. This is one thing that shocked me. He's just, he's just American magazine. Meet, uh, meet him. I'm like, holy shit, he's really Italian. But you know, the the whole crew around Ben Braddock, Lafayette Lee, um, the whole crew around I am seventeen seventy six is great. So you all should, you all should, you should just subscribe to them. That's a that's a subscription that is well worth it. And they oh. publish me, which makes them the ballsiest magazine publishers in the continental United States. Oh, that's a white pill. <laughs> yeah, we'll say uh, if you have made it this far. Thank you very much. Uh, be sure to like and subscribe and do all those things. If you really like the Double Dealer, you can become a paid subscriber on our Substack. You can buy a magazine. Issue 13 is out right now. It's been called the best one yet. Uh, I don't know how to end podcasts, so I will just say insert ending here. <laughs>